the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Dear brothers and sisters, today is the Sunday before the Feast of the Exaltation of the Holy Cross. We're celebrating God's this coming week with the vigil on Wednesday evening, the liturgy on Thursday morning. And each year we have a kind of mini lectionary surrounding the Feast of the Cross, of reading, readings for the Saturday and Sunday before, for the Saturday and Sunday afterwards, and of course, for the Feast itself. And this morning, we have this very short lection from the Gospel of John. But in that lection, although it's short, there is a kind of hyperlink, right? This is the way the New Testament functions. A lot of the words are quotations, allusions, references, to the scriptures which came before. And in the words of our Lord Jesus this morning, he says, just as the serpent was raised in the wilderness by Moses, so too must the Son of Man be lifted up. And those words, when looking in our Bibles, they should be linked. You click on the link, Moses, serpent, wilderness, and it takes us back into the heart of the Torah, of the Pentateuch, in fact, to the Book of Numbers, and takes us to an episode at the time the Israelites were wandering in the desert, in the wilderness, between their liberation from Egypt and their final entrance into the Promised Land, to the land which the Lord had promised to them. And at this point, the Israelites are getting a little bit fed up. In fact, most of the book of Numbers is about that sort of thing. But the people have prayed to God for deliverance from a particular Canaanite king, and they, they've had that victory. But then they realize that Moses is taking them a long way around. Right? And Moses' decision at this point is to avoid the kingdom of the Edomites in order to make the way towards Canaan. Avoiding the Edomites. The Edomites, of course, descendants of the elder son of Isaac, Esau. So they're cousins. Moses doesn't want to get into a scrap with these powerful tribes who are, in fact, their own relatives. The people have had enough. And at that point, they turn and they say to Moses, This is nice. We have no food. We have no drink. We're tired. And what's more, this bread that you've been giving to us, we're sick of it. And what happens subsequently is the Lord allows the people to be afflicted by fiery serpents, it says. By the by, the word in Hebrew is seraph. Seven times in the Old Testament the word seraph appears and refers to snakes. Only once does it refer to angels, and that's in Isaiah chapter 6. Take that for what it's worth. The fiery serpents, the seraphim, afflict the people, and many die, and many are sick, and so the people turn back. And God asks Moses to do this extraordinary thing when he intercedes for the people. He says, well, make an image of the seraph, the fiery serpent, and put it on a pole and raise it in the midst and have those people who are afflicted look at it. Gaze at it. Gaze at it. Behold it. And those who do so in faith will be healed. Well, it's an extraordinary episode. And the fact that the Lord refers to it here in this short reading from John is significant for us. So let's see a little bit more about what's going on here and why there's a connection with the Son of Man being lifted up. I don't think it's simply, well, John is looking, or Jesus in the Gospel of John is looking for a metaphor of something going up. You could imagine many things could be used if they didn't know what up meant to illustrate the point. There's something more and fundamental about this episode in the book of Numbers, which is instructive for us in understanding the cross, but more significantly, understanding our own faith development and spiritual life. 
Because what a contrast there is by this point, Numbers chapter 21, with the very first moments of deliverance from Egypt. But think back to Exodus chapter 15, the song of Moses, that great song of glory and redemption and deliverance and freedom. God truly is God. God truly is the one in whom we can trust, whom we can love, because look what he's done. The powerful tyrant and oppressor has been set down, and the, the poor, the, the righteous ones have been lifted up. And so in this great moment of conversion, there's euphoria, there's joy. And I do mean conversion. We sometimes picture the people in, of Israel in Egypt as being these very devout, faithful people who are being oppressed by the Egyptian, Egyptians. But after decades and hundreds of years, there probably wasn't much belief left or much practice embodied in their, in their life. We see that because when Moses goes, to the people and says, by the way, God wants to deliver you. There's skepticism. What God? Who are you talking about? We don't know anything about this. There's no religious practice. There's no faith. There's no living the life uh, that God had called his people to do by calling Abraham into a covenant family in the first instance. So Moses converts the people to the worship of the living God and shows them that God is real by that deliverance. And in that moment, in that early, those early days of conversion to the faith, the people are happy. They're joyous. That, that grace that they've experienced carries them through initial setbacks. And of course, they get things wrong, but they repent, and things look pretty good. But then what happens? Life, right? Life hits the convert. Life hits the person who's come with great joy into God's covenant family. Life hits and suffering and struggles and questions and doubts. And all that begins to erode that initial joy. And the people at this point have two choices, really. One is to accept the experience of life and the suffering and struggle and to use that as an opportunity to grow in faith, to grow in trust of God, to understand that God is not absent in the wilderness, in the time of difficulty, in times of hunger, in times of, of darkness or of sickness. In fact, God is most present in those moments, and that's the opportunity of the wilderness of life, to grow closer and deepen our faith in God. The other alternative, which we see the people taking here, is instead to reject the experience of the wilderness, to want to call back to some sort of simpler faith, to some sort of certainty or surety, to some sort of theology that gives cover and protection. And then what happens is a kind of defensive posture, a lashing out. And who do they lash out? They lash out at the authorities. They tell Moses that he's, he's insane, that he's taking them from a place where they were comfortable, they say. The reality, of course, was slavery. But why did you take us away from them? And they say all kinds of things, questioning Moses' leadership and questioning the theology that he's presenting to them, right? This isn't right. We don't have food and drink, they say, and then contradict themselves in the next moment. And the food you've given us, we don't even like anymore. So they have food, they just don't like it. Nothing's right for them. They question their leaders. They call into question the whole experience that God has brought them into. And what they think they're doing is returning to something simpler and more straightforward and maybe truer and correct, right? A more exact faith. God that we believe in will be like this and fits in this box neatly. Thank you very much. But what in fact they're doing when they challenge Moses, and the narrative makes this very clear, is they are cutting themselves off from God himself. They're cutting themselves off from the very story of salvation that they're living. They're forgetting all of the moments of deliverance. They're 
forgetting the very history that they're part of. And of course it's difficult, and of course it's tiring, and of course it's the long way around when you go around the Edomites to get to Cain. But that's what the story is. And what they don't realize, in fact, we sometimes picture this happening somewhere in the middle of the 40 years. This is happening in year 39. One year from the death of Moses and Joshua leading the people across the Jordan. Just one year. The story is unfolding. They don't realize it because their categories have become so fixed. And their desire to lash out at what they've been led into is cutting them off in the very experience of salvation that God is showing to them. In a year, they will be crossing the Jordan and coming into the promised land. How reminiscent is this sometimes of our own experience of conversion, that initial joy, the grace that accompanies it. But then when we're hit with struggles, we want to revert to simple categories, simple binaries and truths. And we want to reject what we're learning from the experience of life. We don't want to go and look hard in the wilderness for the very presence of the living God whom we met in the joy of our conversion. And yet this is what the story asks us to do. And Jesus, in calling this to our minds when he speaks about the cross, is saying something very profound to us about how faith develops about what it means truly to take up that cross and follow it. And here's the thing. What's the remedy in the end when we've lost the plot, when we've cut ourselves off from that story of salvation? Is it to return and get sort of tidy and neat truths theologically and categories that are all lined up? No, it's to stare into the face of the experience we are having, the very struggle itself, that's why the serpent, the seraph, is placed on the staff, and the people are asked to do this extraordinary thing, this psychologically and spiritually very difficult thing, which is to look at the very thing that is causing pain, the very thing that is afflicting them, and to see in there the activity of the living God, that God is not abandon them. No matter how tired and hungry and frustrated and fed up they are, God is with them. And that's what they're called to do. Not to idolize that. In fact, there's another narrative in the scriptures that tells us exactly why we're not supposed to do that. That very staff with the bronze serpent on it is kept as a treasure in Israel. But later on, the people begin to idolize that and worship that rather than the power of the living God working in and through the people and their own unfolding story. And so one of the few good kings of Israel, King Hezekiah, smashes this relic. Interesting for those of us in the Orthodox Church where relics play such an important part. There comes a point when the relic is idolatrous and Hezekiah does not hesitate to smash it. And so when our Lord refers to it, he's not referring to a physical object that exists anymore. It's in the living memory of the people. So we don't idolize our suffering and struggle. We don't wallow in trauma. But we see the face of God, his very presence in the midst of those things. And that's what this upcoming feast of the cross is all about. And we'll have more to say about that in the coming week, about the meaning of taking an instrument of torture, of hell, and inscribing it with light and life, and indeed elevating it in our midst, not to idolize it, not to worship it, but to see the activity and presence of the living God throughout. So let us your brothers and sisters, as we go through the wilderness of our lives and the desert of our lives, and even when we're tired and upset and hungry and thirsty, let us seek the resources God still gives us, the support of one another, the love of everyone in the covenant family of God's kingdom. 
Let us turn to one another. Let us support one another on this journey. And let us not lash out at this or that, at this leader or that one, because by doing so, we are cutting ourselves off from the very story in which our salvation is being worked out. But instead, let us learn to push through from that simplicity of early conversion to complexity and perplexity to the mystery and paradox of God's love for the whole world.